Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Building Bridges, uh, Spilling the Tea with our candidates. Um, I just wanted to give a quick overview of Building Bridges for America. We were founded under uh, Mayor Pete's run for president in 2020, and we are guided by his servant uh, leadership's principles of servant leadership. And we basically um, train the trainer. So we really focus on um, doing free workshops throughout the week. Um, to equip grassroots organizers um, to support campaigns and causes based on progressive values. Our rules of the road from Mayor Pete are the values that we are guided under, which are respect, belonging, truth, teamwork, boldness, responsibility, substance, discipline, excellence, and joy. We look, we try to approach all of our vision through four lenses, which are bridging the rural and urban divide, belonging, democratic reform, and racial equity. As I referred to earlier, we do have a free grassroots training throughout the week, usually on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and they cover a variety of topics, which are actually very timely right now. Um, unlocking your political power, conversations that break through, making the hard ask, popping the disinformation bu bubble, and Civics 101 are just a few of those. So you can find us um, at buildingbridgesforamerica.com and sign up for any of those workshops for free. We also have currently 35 endorsed candidates for the general election for 2022. We support them in many ways, such as the Sunday evening town hall Q and A's. We also write postcards for all of our candidates. We do phone banking, text banking, and, um, and any other way that we can, we can help them out. Next week, upcoming candidate events is, um, we interviewed Dr. Terrence Ruth, who's running for mayor of Raleigh back in January, but his race has changed a little bit since then. So we are inviting him back because um, it's gonna be a really good race and it's a really tight race. So uh, we wanna check in with him and see how that's going. And tonight's special guest is Justin Chenette, who's running for York County Commissioners in District 3, and that's in Maine. Um, you can find out more about him on his website at accountable to you.com and all of social media. He is Ju Justin Chinnett. So now I am going to, um, and you can also visit us on all social media too at Build Bridges for America. Now I'm going to stop my screen sharing and I'm going to kick it over to Justin to give us his intro and tell us why he is running for local office. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Melissa, and thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, I just have to say, I really want to thank the group and Building Bridges for everything that the Volunteer Network has done, not just for my campaign, but for campaigns across the country. Um, we won our primary with 83% of the vote, and it's in part to volunteers like yourselves that are so engaged in so many races, even if it's not in your immediate area, it really makes an impact. It makes a difference to write those posts cards to make those phone calls everything that you're doing it sometimes it may seem onerous it may seem like oh my gosh does this really move the needle it absolutely does we value you it, it is deeply appreciated and um, subsequently we're going to be able to make incredible progress because of your help so um, I just wanted to give you guys a quick shout out um, as Melissa said um, I'm running for a county commissioner in the state of Maine um, and I think somebody had asked a question what does a, a county commissioner do well well, that's a great question. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm in this race, um, not just in Maine, but across the country. I think uh, there tends to be a tendency to not have an understanding of all the different levels of government and all the different positions. I mean, there's just a lot to unpack. Um, and so in the state of Maine in particular, we've noticed county government really gets the short end of the stick. Not a lot of people pay attention to this level of government. Um, a lot of folks don't even know who their county commissioner is or what they do. Um, and just to kind of give you a quick recap, um, this is a branch of government that, at least for the state of Maine, um, handles a number of important categories. It handles um, the county sheriff's office and the county jail system. 
Um, so criminal justice reform is at the center of those conversations. Um, it handles public health emergencies. So the pandemic is a, a critical example of that. Right now, we have a health clinic that's providing COVID vaccinations and monkeypox vaccinations. So they handle public health emergency situations. So just those two buckets alone are enough to be paying attention to what's happening in county government. And they do so many other things, the DA's office, uh, probate court. Um, and so it, it may not necessarily be um, as sexy as like a state legislative role or in Congress, but I find that um, it's pretty close to the people. Um, and there's critical decisions that have to be made uh, that and can be made to really move the needle on a lot of different fronts. Uh, the federal government, um, and particularly President Joe Biden um, and Congress, uh, were able to, to, to pass a number of different pieces of legislation that helped um, uh, sort of distribute monies down to the county level uh, in order to help revitalize our communities, help to support us coming out of the pandemic. Um, and so counties have been that structure to distribute those funds. And so for us, uh, $40 million coming to our county is a big deal uh, when our typical annual budget is $20 million. So $40 million injection um, into our county is significant. And so how we spend those critical dollars are going to be important uh, moving forward. Um, and so there might be projects that we can anticipate uh, regarding public transit. We can think about how do we, especially with living on the coast in Maine, climate change and coastal erosion are critical issues. How do we spend these dollars wisely where we engage the public in that process uh, and then, then think big um, because now's that opportunity to do so. So I'm in this race because, you know, quite frankly, our, our elected officials at the county level have not adequately engaged the public and the community. Um, and, and I wanna turn that around. I wanna make sure that the public um, is tired of hearing from me, quite frankly. I want them to be like, okay, Justin, we know what you're working on. We appreciate it, but you don't need to, to tweet at us every five seconds. But that's a, good, that's a good problem to have. We want our elected officials to be engaged with the people that they're supposed to represent, right? You should know whether it's a column in the newspaper, whether it's a Facebook post, whether it's office hours or it's holding town hall forums. It's just critically important to be engaged Engaged with the communities that you serve. That's public service 101. Um, that's one of the tenets of this uh, of the organization that you're that you're volunteering for is, is service above self. It's recognizing that that we need to help others, right? Um, and how you help others is you engage them in the decision making process, not inform them after the fact that a decision has been made, but actually include them and, and have a seat at the table. And so um, through office hours, through town hall style forums, I really like that kind of engagement. I think it's important to listen to people as much as, as talk at them. I think it's important that we have a conversation, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited about that. So we are going into the general election um, without a Republican or independent challenger. So um, we are poised to, to win this race. But again, I, I do want to mention it's, it's because of all of you helping in the primary that made that possible. Um, and so now we're just having, continuing to have conversations with the community around their expectations for this role, uh, what they're hoping to see from a policy standpoint, obviously helping other candidates in the area um, succeed as well. Um, um, so it's a little, ch little bit of a change of pace as I was talking to Melissa about, but um, you know, incredible work moving forward. And in January, we hope to, to take office. So uh, that's just a, a quick, quick overview, but definitely open to a lot of questions tonight. So I guess now we should say uh, commissioner elect <laughs> that has a ring to it, Melissa. Absolutely. It <laughs> but I do, from our previous conversations, I want you to tell them your previous background. So oh, Justin has been in elected office on varying levels. And weren't you the youngest elected into the, uh, was it the Senate or the House in Maine? I can't remember. Or both. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I both actually, yeah. So um, I ran uh, for state representative when I was still in college. Um, so I was uh, 20 years old, and I decided I'm going to run for a house seat um, on a whim. And I didn't ask for anyone's permission because if you think you can make a difference, you shouldn't let anybody tell you no, right? You should go for it. So um, I decided to to run for state rep, and I had a competitive primary, competitive general, but we ended up winning. Um, and so I became the youngest openly. Gay 
gay lawmaker in the entire country um, at 21. Um, that was a long time ago, it's a decade ago, darling, decade ago. Now I'm retired, no. Um, but no, it's um, it was great. Uh, I served two terms in the House. Um, and then I decided, you know what? That's not enough. Let's run for the Senate. So I ran for the Senate um, at 24 and was elected at 25 and became um, the youngest senator um, and the only openly LGBT um, senator at the time, which was important when we were talking about conversion therapy and a number of incredibly important pieces of legislation. And I served two terms and then life happens and takes you into mysterious directions. So I could have kept serving, but um, you know, eight years in the legislature is a commitment. Um, and so now I'm excited to, to continue my public service in a different capacity. But that's a, a quick background. I also served on the State Board of Education as a high school student. I was appointed by the governor. And so I was able to help pass, um, sort of think about statewide educational policy when I was younger and, and think about how do we approve school construction projects through the lens of alternative energy. So we were able to look at geothermal inclusion in school construction projects and solar and, and different things like that to help reduce um, our, our, our climate footprint. But at the same time, think about how do we reduce our energy costs, right? And so it was just kind of interesting to be able to have that experience um, in high school. And so that sort of leads us to today. That's amazing. We actually have another high school student, not a high school, I'm sorry, college student um, who's running for the Ohio House that we've endorsed too. So Wonderful. I think that you have set a good path for other people. So thank you for that. Thank you for all your civil service service. Um, Tracy wants to know, she's in Massachusetts and has said um, they have seriously downgraded um, county government status in the past few decades, except for DA and Sheriff Department. So I haven't been too up on it, but how savvy are your voters about the commission? Um, quite frankly, not a lot. Uh, I mean, I think folks have heard about the sheriff's office, um, but probably don't connect it to the fact that there is a branch of government that oversees them. So that's likely going to be their entry point in terms of their knowledge base around the county commission important knowledge base for sure, but we want to connect the dots to all other departments um, that, the, that the commission oversees, and the fact that we are supposed to hold the sheriff's office accountable, right? We want to make sure that um, we're, we're having, you know, difficult conversations sometimes. We're including the public in that process, and so um, I think it's really going to be about, and we've tried to do this on this campaign, um, is really educate people, and it's really baseline education. Here's county government, here's the structure, um, and here's, here's who represents you, and so let's get a part of that conversation. One of the issues that I've noticed is because of the structure of state government that we've allowed to take place, um, meetings are really inaccessible. Uh, to the public. Meetings right now for us um, are at 4.30 in the afternoon in the middle of our county, and we have a pretty large geographic uh, county. Um, and, and then like workshops and special meetings are at three o'clock in the afternoon. And I don't know, there's working Mainers that can't attend in the middle of the day or in the middle of the afternoon. Um, and so um, they can set their meetings whenever they want. There's only two meetings a month. So this is not the legislature. This is not Congress. You don't have to meet during the day. Um, and so I did bring these issues forward. I actually spoke in front of the county commission and said, hey, before I ran, I was like, hey, I want you to fix this. <laughs> you know, just an hour shift at 5.30 would make, would do wonders for trying to get folks to actually be at the meeting so that it's not an empty room every time there's a county commission meeting, because this contributes to the fact that people don't know much about it um, and, and, and its importance, because if you can't make the meetings, it's going to be hard to engage, right? And so um, that's, and it sounds like a simple thing, just changing the meeting time, but um, it goes a long way to try to re-engage folks. And so a lot of city council, town council, there's a reason why they theoretically have their meetings in the evening, um, you know, 5.30, 6 o'clock, 6.30, 7 o'clock even, it's because they are at least seeking or hoping to seek public engagement in that process. You might still get one person, the same person that shows up to every meeting, but guess what? You're giving people the opportunity to engage. If they don't take it, that's, that's a whole other conversation, but you need to give people the opportunity to be there um, because I, I absolutely believe that um, once folks are given the opportunity and you connect the dots of why it's relevant to their lives, uh, they'll show up, they'll participate, they'll make their voice heard. We just have to give people the, the opportunity to do so. Absolutely. I love that. And like you said, I think people have shifted, I don't know around you, but here to like 530 for the 
city council meetings and school board meetings. And it does seem to make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, So I was reading an article about the air quality in New York Mm -hmm. and um, that it sounded like the commissioners um, just put in plan, put in, in place a plan to address that along with some other environmental issues in February. Can you tell us a little bit about that plan and what kind of environmental um, issues that you experience in your communities? Absolutely. Um, Well, the environment is a critical issue. Uh, As I mentioned earlier, like we live on the coast, so we're seeing the impact, let's say, of coastal erosion, for instance, is a big one. Um, I mean, literally, almost every year we have houses literally washing away because of climate change and also an Army Corps of Engineer project that probably was not supposed to happen to begin with. And so we have a sort of a combination of factors there. Um, But one of the things that we're noticing, um, not just just from an air quality standpoint, but from water in particular, is the record drought that we're facing because of climate change is causing so many wells to dry up. And so that's becoming a critical issue that I'm hearing from so many folks is, what are we going to do to, to assist folks? And when we have entities that they've changed the name of the company, but essentially Poland Springs um, is is housed in in my district, uh, one of the bottling plants, Um, and they recently wanted to uh, double the amount of water they were extracting from our local aquifer. And of course, everyone was like, in the middle of a severe drought, you're going to double the amount of water you're extracting. It didn't make sense. And so we were able to galvanize folks and say, hey, this doesn't make sense in front of the planning board. We need to stop this. Uh, And luckily, they pulled that uh, at the last minute. Uh, They'll be back. Um, But it's things like that where it may not be necessarily a policy issue, though I think in that case, we need to have more of a statewide conversation around how do we protect our water supply? That can't just be a county or a local district decision, because oftentimes, you know, we don't have experts at the local level that can do this, or we can't afford to, to really have that, that difficult conversation. It really needs to come from the state level um, of protecting our water, pr- making sure that it's a public right. Um, you know, those things are critically important, and that we're pushing back at, on, on, on corporations extracting water with no equity. With that, and that, that's a big piece for me is no public equity in that process. Um, so that's just one component. You mentioned air quality. You know, Maine is known for having clean air, clean water, um, a, a wonderful outdoor uh, environment and culture. Um, we want to protect that for future generations. Um, and, and it starts with just thinking about when we pass legislation, when we pass policies, when we do major projects, we have to put everything through the prism of what's going to happen 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years. We cannot just be thinking um, very short-sighted. We can't just be thinking about the the next year or or in the immediacy Um, because these projects, um, you know, these policies are going to be with us and have a lingering impact. So I think when we're looking at how do we spend the federal relief dollars, um, I think we really need to have conversations around protecting our coast. We need to be thinking about how do we convert to alternative energy sources for our government buildings? Um, How do we reduce our carbon footprint? Um, Something as simple as a a water bottling station may seem very small, but it helps to reduce our reliance on plastics, right? And so there's so many little things like that that add up. And so even though county government in Maine might be a on the lower end of the totem pole, every decision can be impactful if there's intention behind it um, and and we have thoughtful conversations where everyone's at the table. Thank you, I very much appreciate that. Um, Tracy wants to know, are you concerned about the growing anti-LGBTQ attitudes nationwide affecting Maine and what are you seeing there? Absolutely. It's a deep concern. Um, And it's a concern that on a whim, the Supreme Court can just evaporate your rights um, and make you a second class citizen like we've seen um, with the Roe decision. Um, And so I think it's I think it's one of those things where representation really does matter in in positions of power. Um, You know, I think it's beyond just the fact that, oh, we have, let's say a member of the York County Commission that's a member of the LGBT plus community. It's about when conversations come up, um, you can bring your full self to the table. Um, and, And that means everyone 
um, can feel listened to and can feel heard and can break down barriers. When you engage with and interact with folks that may be different from you and have a different background, um, it, it does change the dynamic. I will tell you, uh, being one of the only openly gay legislators in Maine at the time, um, you know, there were conversations that I had with lawmakers privately, you know, where folks would say, like, they didn't know what LGBTQ meant, like they thought it was a BLT sandwich or something, right? They don't, they didn't make that connection. And then when we would have conversations about, let's say, banning conversion therapy, which luckily we did in the state of Maine, you know, I had to have difficult conversations around how, how that can be impactful for a young person to, to see the fact that we're doing this and, and trying to protect them, that they feel valued at the end of the day, and the fact that so many don't feel valued and, and turn to things like the Trevor Project suicide line, for instance, because they feel like they don't have an out, they don't feel supported at home. Um, and so it, it does help to break down barriers when you have folks at the table. Um, and I think in this role, I think it's going to be really important that we think about the optics of having somebody that's that's the first in this role to be able to be from that community. Um, and so let's recognize Pride Month, for instance. It's just, it, you know, it sounds simple, but it's like when our county doesn't fly the, fly, you know, the pride flag or doesn't recognize Pride Month, it sounds like a, such a simple thing, but it, it does make an impact and it slowly, you know, counters, I think, a lot of the negativity that we're seeing in demonizing people that are different uh, simply for being themselves. And so I think the more that we can shine a light um, on our own lives, the more that we can be open with ourselves, you know, in the campaign, I don't shy away from the fact I have a husband and I frequently, when I can drag him to events, I will drag him to an event, um, you know? And so it's more about not liking going to events, but you know, it's one of those things where I don't shy away from that fact. It, it just, that's just my life. It's just one of those things. Um, and Mayor Pete did that so skillfully during the presidential run. It's like, it just wasn't, it was like second nature. It was, just, it was just like every other candidate would have their spouse. And I think the more we treat it with a sense of normalcy um, and, and the more we engage with authentic conversations from the heart, um, it changes the policy conversation. I'm always about how can we personalize politics? And when we do that, um, I find we help to change hearts and minds uh, on some difficult topics. So I think how we counter the negativity, how we counter the hate is not to match that rhetoric. Um, it, it, it's to tone down the rhetoric, have an honest heart to heart conversation. That's how we won marriage equality in the state of Maine. We didn't berate people that believe something different than we did. We didn't say, oh my gosh, I can't believe you don't want to give me the right to marry. It's like, you know, hey, when I'm knocking on their door, you know what? It would be nice if I could marry my partner, right? That's mm. very different than a number on a spreadsheet or some external thing that you're thinking about from the news media or wherever you get your news. It, it, it makes it very real and human for people. And, and we can treat a lot of issues like that. So I think that that's the value of having a diverse set of voices at the table. Are you can just say one quick follow up. Are you concerned about the perceived delay of the vote on the marriage re, re, to respect for marriage act? And uh, are you fearing that there's a return to oh they're looking for special privileges that other people don't have in their marriages? Um, I, I'm very concerned about the delay because I'm I'm not sure the tactic of delaying till after the election is, is over with is somehow going to radically change um, the vote total. I mean, to me, I feel like now there's some leverage. You should use the leverage now when you have it. After the election, if folks are voted out, there's no leverage. I guess they think that they could have some more leeway there. I, I don't, but I, maybe greater minds are, are at work there. I just, I don't see that connection. To me, and, and I'm coming from a state legislative perspective, you put everything on the floor. You take a vote on everything. Um, and if folks, if you don't have the votes, call them out for it. It's a roll call vote. They have to be held accountable to their vote. And if it doesn't pass the first time, you come back and you try to pass it again. Like I, 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 I don't, I don't prescribe to the notion that it's a one and done situation. Um, but again, that's from a state legislative perspective, where sometimes you do vote on things um, more than once. And if you don't, you don't win. You, you table it and you bring it back. Um, but I think it's important to put people on the record. Uh, and accountability is important. Um, so I'm concerned about it. Um, it's, it's really. Scary scary that, again, um, we're having these conversations that I thought were, were, were over with and we can focus on uh, more substantive pieces of legislation or substantive policy debates, whether or not um, the, the federal government recognizes my marriage should not be up for conversation in 2022, but yet 
here we are again. Um, so I'm hoping Congress knows what it's doing, but I think between now and the election day, what we can do um, as part of this process is to ensure we elect individuals who believe in marriage equality, who believe in a right for a woman to make her own uh, health care choices and reproductive health care choices. And so those things we have control over. And so I know it sometimes can feel like there's these things that are happening without our control in Congress and DC, and it feels very remote. Um, but we actually have a lot of power at our disposal, but we just have to put forth the effort and, and do it. And I think this group is a great example of how you can amplify important voices uh, and engage everyone in the conversation to actually create a great turnout for the midterms. I think we're seeing a lot of energy and enthusiasm. We're just channeling that to get people to register to vote uh, and to vote um, on or before November 8th. Absolutely. Um, so I know housing, affordable housing has been an issue around the country, especially I think in the Northeast for probably quite a while. And is that the case in York County and in Maine? And is there anything that the, the County Board of Commissioners can do to rectify that or help change that? Yeah, it's a big problem. Um, I think what we're what we're seeing is, especially with the pandemic, um, everyone wanted to move to areas that um, were more vacation oriented um, or had a different change of pace than what they were used to. So we saw an influx of a lot of folks from um, New York, Massachusetts, uh, you know, California, a lot of different higher populated areas um, moving to Maine. I mean, Maine's a beautiful place. I can't, can't blame them for wanting to come here. But I think what ended up happening is now when a home goes, you know, goes on the market for sale, I mean, you're getting $75,000, $100,000 over asking price. And so what ends up happening is all the values, well, it's great that values go up. What ends up happening is the local folks who's uh, you know, for the most part, our wages are not as high, for sure, as uh, other metropolitan areas cannot afford housing. Um, and, and rent subsequently is impacted by that as well. Um, so I think the state is doing a lot of important things. They just had a housing commission come up with a series of recommendations, including um, trying to encourage folks to think about adding like an additional dwelling on their on their property um, to, to rent out to, to help with the, um, the inventory problem, which is, is really important. Um, encouraging sort of multi-generational living, like, um, you know, there are other cultures around the world that actually enjoy having multiple um, generations in the same household, there's some benefit to that, um, if folks can emotionally handle that. But, um, you know, I think it's one of those things where we have to work hand in hand with the state government. And I think there's some potentially some federal solutions as well um, to protect people um, uh, and, and keep people either in their home, like, for instance, um, keeping seniors in their home when when the values go up, their property taxes increase. And so that's a critical issue. So what the county can do in terms of part of that process is to look at the property tax rate from the county level. So we're, we're a contributing factor, but not the only factor. Municipalities play a big role in that. Um, but we can ensure that we're spending money wisely, that we're uh, keeping budgets um, uh, you know, fiscally responsible um, so that we're not passing along um, a big bill to, to folks on fixed income. Uh, but I think county officials have to work with uh, municipal folks um, who ultimately set uh, the, the municipal uh, property tax rate and then the state government. And when I was in state government, we focused on trying to expand critical property tax relief programs. Um, and that just addresses one aspect of the problem is just keeping existing folks in their home, particularly with the, the state of Maine being a senior heavy state, uh, where I think one of the oldest, if not the oldest in terms of a population uh, in the state of, in, in the country. And so as a result, we need to protect our seniors. They need to be able to, to live comfortably and age comfortably in place in the communities where their families are at. They have a support network. Uh, that's really critical. Uh, the county can also play a role in just making sure that we're supporting organizations like um, Habitat for Humanity, who provides um, you know, housing to those who really need it. They just built a, a house in, in my own city that was critically important. So there are things that we can do. Um, I think we just have to, to, to really bring all levels levels of government together. I mean, a lot of times we operate in silos where it's like, oh, the federal government has to do this or the state government has to do this. And there's so many levels of government. And sometimes people are like, I just need the problem solved. I don't care which level of government does it. And so I'm a big believer in let's get everyone at the same table, right? When we're having a conversation about housing, no one should be left out of that. Um, and we can see how 
who can take which part of that pie, right? Are we talking about uh, rent freezes? Are we talking about um, uh, rent increase caps, for instance? And, and those are being held at the municipal level, but should there be a, a, a wider conversation about that? Um, property tax relief programs, um, you know, incentives for, for new housing developments that are focusing on uh, lower and middle income families, you know, all of these things we can have a more robust conversation about. But I know there, uh, my friends in the legislature are, are on the task. And I know we're we're moving the needle a little bit, but um, it's incredibly difficult um, when a lot of these things are, are centered in the private sector. And so you're trying to 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 ensure that you know, uh, the de development is responsible. Uh, but at the same time, we're, we increase the inventory out there because right now people just can't find housing. And it's also a business and corporate issue as well. The Chamber of Commerce should act, act, actively be involved in this conversation just as much as progressive groups, because, you know, ultimately when they can't find a workforce for um, their business, their corporation, guess what ends up happening? Uh, it hurts their bottom line. And so um, everyone's impacted when folks cannot afford or find um, affordable housing. That sounds like you have a multi-prong approach. And so that's very good that you're trying to do what you can do. Um, Teresa wants to know, how can we change the law so that gay men can give blood? That's a health question. Is it a state level or federal level issue? That's a great question. Um, I've always been irked by this because, um, you know, I always hear from folks that there's a blood shortage, there's a blood shortage, but we don't want your blood. Okay, great. Fantastic. Um, but I want to help uh, save a life, right? Um, and so what the FDA has done is lifted the lifetime ban uh, on gay and bisexual men from donating blood, which is a, an important step, but not the end of the conversation. Um, because before, when I was in college, there was a lifetime ban. <laughs> so you bet basically we're out of luck. Um, and, and, and they've started to shift that um, to a model of one year deferral. I think now they've ratcheted it back. Um, I think it it's now... Now. Mm -hmm. Three months now. Three months now, right. So now they've ratcheted it back to three months. So we're getting better. I just want them to use science um, and data and facts uh, to base their decisions on rather than outdated um, stigmas. Um, and so I think um, they test every person's blood, <laughs> every person's donated blood. So it, it, this is, I just don't understand why we can't just be treated with everybody else in the same category. Um, it, it just still mind boggles me. But so this is an FDA um, decision, a federal decision, but here's what um, like state legislatures can do, for instance, they could pass resolutions demanding Congress and the federal government take action. Um, and so um, I did introduce that once in the legislature, but I was, I was shot down. It could couldn't, couldn't make it through a process, but, and that was just a resolution demanding something, which you know how, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a nice feeling, but it doesn't actually solve the problem. But it, it, it helps to elevate the fact that, hey, this issue matters to this particular state. And, and you need to pay attention to it. So if, if let's say a lot of state legislatures pass their own resolutions saying, hey guys, you need to base this on science. In fact, at least it helps elevate the convert. It brings it to the forefront um, and, and we can talk about it, but it is a federal, a federal issue. Um, so I'm, I'm thankful that they've whittled it down to three months instead of a lifetime ban. But I will tell you growing up with a lifetime ban, I think even like the marriage thing was always lingering, but that probably irked me even more only because it just really made me feel, it made, I'll just be honest, it made me feel dirty. It made me feel very less than um, to be like, oh, I can't, I'm never going to accept your blood um, when you can test it and know that it's just fine. You know what I mean? And so I, I just never quite wrap my head around that. Um, when if you based it on science, then we can have a scientific conversation. But when you don't base it on science or fact, I have a hard time wrapping my head around it. So, um, but it's, thank you for bringing it up. It, it's still, it's troublesome. We still have a blood shortage in this country. I think coming out of the pandemic in particular, I think people were nervous us to, to give blood because then they're around more people. And so we're, we're still dealing with the after effects of that. And so um, I think one way to address that is encourage more folks to, to participate, um, I don't know, using science and information to base their decision on the acceptance of that blood donation. Fantastic. Let's hope that that gets resolved because I know that is a painful subject for many, many, many I get blood people. frequently and it pisses me off. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, so in your, in York County, um, 
I'm assuming that you have suburban areas, you have rural areas, you have city areas. How do you, so one of our lenses was bridging that rural and urban divide. How do you reach out to the voters in the rural areas to make them know that they're heard and that you see them and that you consider their votes very important? That's a great question, Melissa. I think one of the things that I very much value is you have to meet folks where they're at. Um, you have to go to them. Uh, and that is quite literal, but it's also figurative. But you could literally meet them where they're at. Um, and part of it is, um, you know, if there's a community event, you set up a table and you're there, right? Um, and so um, I think it was shared on social. Um, I do participate every year in, a, it's called a pirate festival. Um, and so in one of the rural uh, parts of the district, um, their only festival they have for the entire year is a pirate festival. It's so interesting. It's like, what? Um, but it's super fun. Um, it's super fun. And so every year, I think for the past, it, it, Minus the pandemic, I think it's been like six years that I've been the MC of this pirate festival. Um, and so again, on the surface, doesn't seem like a political or policy type conversation, but you meet everyone in town, right? You, you're, yeah, you might be dressed up in a pirate costume, um, but at the same time, people know uh, that you're accessible you can come up to me and just talk to me. And we've had conversations about water extraction. We've had conversations about random things. And yes, I might have a pirate you know, accent or costume on, but that's okay, right? Um, again, meeting folks where they're at. Um, and so that matters, right? And again, it might be just one event, but that, you know, you're, you're there for like 12 hours. So it's, a, it's an impactful day. Um, and so I think that's important. Um, I also think giving folks an opportunity in rural parts of the district or rural communities, um, a chance to just be heard. Uh, you know, a, a lot of times events, and I, I mentioned the, uh, the Pirate Festival because that's their only event that they do in terms of a large scale festival. You know, the, a lot of the attention and a lot of the events are taking place in other more populated communities. And so to, to do something, let's say like a town hall forum um, in a rural community that doesn't get a lot of attention and doesn't have a lot of opportunities for that engagement, um, it matters, you know, and you may only get 10 people. And that's a lot. But if you get 10 people to show up, that's 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 significant. Um, and those 10 people are going to be like, wow, I, I just had this great, robust conversation around property tax policy or we had this, you know, I just wanted to make my voice heard about something else. And maybe it's not relevant to my particular role, but we're still going to talk through it. We're going to see, is there a solution somewhere? Do we need to connect you to somebody that we know that could help? You know, that that matters. And so sometimes going above and beyond your role um, is important. Um, and, and because no one wants to hear like, oh, well, you don't handle that. So that's the end of the help, right? Like, no, we're going to, um, maybe we'll put you in touch with a legislator. Maybe we're going to put you in touch with a state department or a municipal official, but we'll find a contact if it's not me, right? Uh, I really enjoy those town hall forum type conversations. Sometimes they get a, a little rambunctious, right? And sometimes, um, you know, I've never had something where I was be, like very fearful, but, um, you know, when somebody is loud, um, it means they're passionate uh, about the topic. Or when someone gets riled up, it just there's something in them that they they really want to get off their chest. They really want to, and if when it's done respectfully, when it's done in a way that is safe, um, I think it's important to have those those difficult conversations. Uh, and I may still disagree with the person, but but we're gonna we're gonna air that out, and, and it's gonna be in a public setting. Um, so I think that that's important. Um, so again, meeting folks where they're at showing up to events, even if it's the only one that they have, um, and, and giving folks an opportunity, whether it's office hours or a town hall forum, uh, even if it's like once a year, it's something more than nothing. And I think with remote capabilities now, we're starting to see, um, I find that there's actually more engagement when you give up folks an opportunity to engage digitally. Um, and we do have broadband problems in the state of Maine. So that's another area where gov the, our governor and the legislature are working on. Maybe the county can play a role with some of the federal funds uh, in broadband expansion. But if folks have access to the internet, I find when you do, let's say, a, um, a virtual office hours or like a conversation we're having tonight, uh, it, it increases the awareness and the attention. And even if you don't get a lot of people actually participating in the meeting, they see the follow-up video to it and, they're, and they learn a lot. They, they, wanna, they wanna engage a little bit more. So I find that that's sort of an untapped resource and, 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 and something coming out of the pandemic we can continue um, to, to engage with on because 
uh, if folks have access to the internet, sometimes people don't want to leave the comfort of their home to engage, or they can't. Maybe they have mobility issues, for instance. So it's about access and accessibility more than anything else to give folks an opportunity to engage in, no matter the modality. It's a great answer. Thank you for that. Um, so I know that you have been one of your passions is motivating younger younger voters to become active know why you know a local state federal government is important to them um and i know you have a lot of i think youthful volunteers correct that help your campaign that's what i thought um what's your secret sauce when it comes to motivating these because you know they have the reputation of not being that engaged but I think that that's very incorrect. So how do you get people engaged and excited about politics? Absolutely. Um, I find that um, with each younger generation, I find that they're they're more passionate um, and more engaged. Um, I, honestly, I mean, I'm so impressed with um, like Gen Z and what they're doing around climate change and uh, climate strikes and everything that they're doing um, to, to elevate in issues that they're passionate about. They're finding their own ways of making their voice heard. And my cat's gonna join us for a little bit, Mr. Biscuits. He's just gonna hang out with us or he's gonna go away. He's like, you're talking very loudly. Um, and so um, he's my emotional support. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I don't think there's a secret sauce. I think you give folks an opportunity um, to, to be heard, but also to um, find an opportunity to learn skill sets, right? And so how I like to package it is, is no different than how everyone else does it, but you know, internships, you know, and, 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 and opportunities to have titles on the campaign. I don't care what title you have. If you want to do something on the campaign, you got a title. There we go. Um, but it matters, right? Because folks are thinking about like their resume, they're thinking about those things. So I like to think of it almost like a company or a business, right? I, I want to make sure that they get something out of the experience. And so what can they do uh, to, to, to maximize their interest, uh, maximize their um, engagement? Um, and then they, they take something from it so that they're able to then go on and be their own leader in the community or run for office. And so I like to, to, to try to provide as much opportunity as possible. So for instance, um, you know, every campaign I've ever run, the campaign manager has been either in high school or college, right? Um, and, and whether that's a legislative race or that's a county level race. Um, and in subsequently to that, it draws other young people who see, wow, well, my gosh, like the campaign managers at high school, I could do it. So we've had middle school students volunteer, you know, um, and, and, and because we make community an element to to our campaign. It's not just stuffing envelopes and making phone calls or knocking on doors, which we do, uh, but it's also about showing up to those events like the, the Pirate Festival, showing up to, to other events in the community, meeting folks where they're at, um, bringing, bringing the youth to town hall meetings. I brought my interns with me on the road to, to town hall forums. They see directly that kind of back and forth engagement. Um, and, and yeah, are, are all of the interns and, and volunteers going to run for office one day? Probably not. I always encourage them to do so, but they find their voice in their leadership role in different and package differently, right? Um, there's there's a, a former intern of mine became a police officer, right? That's his vehicle of service. He took leadership skills, communication skills, community engagement skills, and he's bringing that to our local police department. That's wonderful. That's all I could ask for, right? And my former campaign manager, she's becoming, she's going to law school. She wants to become a lawyer, right? That's her vehicle. I could see her run for office too, but that's her vehicle of service, right? Everyone has their own vehicle. So what I like to do is just kind of package each experience. And I do spend a lot of time with, with um, my youthful volunteers of hearing from them, what do they want? Like, what are, they, what are they thinking about for a job? What are they thinking about for a career path? What are they thinking about for college? And we work through maybe driving to a campaign event or driving around the district, putting up signs. I want to hear from them so I can provide at least some tidbits. I don't pretend to know all the answers or all the information, but I find that sometimes it's important to inject some realism to the conversation. Um, so if you're interested in politics, you don't always have to major in political science, right? There's lots of different paths. And so I like to just try to make Make sure that folks see the real side, the hard work behind the policy and the politics, um, and the various paths that folks can choose if they want to make an impact and make a difference. Because that there's there's 
politics is just one path. There's the policy path, there's nonprofits, there's there's so many different things. And I want them to, to, ha to have those different experiences and to maybe intern at other places and kind of see that. So as they're venturing off into the real world, they can, they can say, you know what, I volunteered there, or I interned there. And because of that, I may want to do that now for the rest of my life. So that's all I hope for. Um, but it, it's just listening to youth, giving them an opportunity, and, and then everyone gets a title. I'm like, Oprah, you get a title, you get a title, everyone gets a title. Because again, titles are free. Um, and so, but the opportunity is priceless. And like, put that on a bumper sticker, right? And so it's just, I, I just love that aspect of it. I have fun uh, with our interns and volunteers, and it's just one of the best things about campaign. I think that's so fantastic. And I think it's also fantastic that you continually show up in that rural area and do the pirate emceeing because <laughs> that's a big complaint about voters is that politicians swoop in, try to get their votes, then they leave and they never see them again. So any way that you can come back and just show that you're there and that you continue to show up is very important. Um, I'm gonna pivot to public education. Um, you know, there has been a drove of teachers leaving the profession, um, you know, attacks at school board, school board meetings, uh, banning books, you know, you name it, it's happening nationwide. What's going on with uh, education in Maine? We're, we're seeing elements of that. Um, I think it, it, it creeps into states, even if you think like, oh, my state is immune, that'll never happen here. Uh, it does. Um, and it's starting to happen, even in, in places that have been very civil in the past. Um, and we're seeing it uh, even on the edges of my of my own district. Um, I'm, uh, we're starting to see those banning of the books conversations. And it's really, it's really hard because um, it creates such a divisive environment um, when folks, because they're obviously passionate about either their children's education or their grandchildren's education, um, you know, uh, that education already can create a lot of passions um, just without bringing into any sort of controversy. Uh, and then when you add that, it's sort of like fuel on the fire. Um, it's difficult. I think, I think we just, again, the more we can set the example for toning down rhetoric and just having more freeing conversations, um, it's important. It's not easy to do that, especially when um, the passions run really high. Um, I think we always have to think about our educators and our students when we make, we're make making decisions. Um, and we can't just think about um, one set of students when we're making decisions, because when we're, we're banning books that may talk about uh, the variety of diverse experiences of our student population, we have to remember that, um, number one, that there's an internet. That's number one. Uh, if the students are actually checking out books, that's a big deal, okay? Um, internet access uh, probably gives them a lot more access to a variety of diverse sources of information than the actual books in the library. So the fact that we're having sub su such substantive conversations about the banning of a book, like somehow that's gonna wave the magic wand and shield the child from ever hearing about diverse sources of information is almost laughable when almost every child now has a cell phone. Um, but anyway, I digress. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, but 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 I think what we have to do um, is support our educators who are doing yeoman's work. I mean, we are seeing burnout amongst educators. We're seeing, um, you know, folks that feel undervalued or underappreciated um, uh, for quite a while. Um, and I think one of the things that the state of Maine has done is trying to set like a minimum uh, 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 sort of salary um, expectation for our uh, wonderful educators so that we're again, trying to elevate their important role and making sure that they're paid adequately and, and, and what they deserve. Um, and, and so when I think when we are in situations where let's say, um, you know, uh, you know, not necessarily a strike per se, but when educators are feeling like they don't have an adequate contract, we need to support them. Right, we need to stand with them, um, and those can be difficult conversations. But they're doing incredible work. Uh, we need to support them. We need to support our students. Um, I find one unifier in in the education conversation is civics education. You know, whether you're conservative or progressive, I think we all see a value 
um, in making sure that we know uh, the basis of our own government. Right. We know that we know how it works. We know um, how to engage with it. Uh, we know how to make progress uh, and can advocate um, as an active and engaged citizen or individual within the country. Um, and so I, I think that that could be not to not that it deviates necessarily from the more controversial topics, um, but I'm hoping that we can at least look to the things that can bring us together, um, like just recognizing some basic information about how our government works. Um, and I find that when young people are engaged about civics, they're going to be more apt to register to vote when they turn 18 or before 18, depending on your municipality or state. Um, and they're going to be more apt to think about their own leadership role in the community. And so I spend a great deal of time going to classrooms and speaking about civics. We make it fun. We use a whoopie pie example if anyone's had a whoopie pie. Um, I wrote a children's book about it, but, um, but we basically just follow the steps of the legislative process, um, including them in the process, and they sort of can bat around ideas, and we go through the steps, and it makes it fun for them. Um, but when I, I, it just, it's really cool to see them light up about it, when they see the connections directly to the fact like, wow, I could actually make a difference. I didn't know I could make my voice heard. And yeah, they might be in fifth grade or sixth grade, and they're, they're just starting to think about those things, but it lays a foundation for the future. Um, so that when they become adults, when they register to vote, um, you know, they're gonna not only participate, but see the value in that participation and cherish the institutions that we have and why they're so critically important so that when we have more difficult conversations or we are in a situation where misinformation is being disseminated by certain sources or certain um, indiv political individuals, we can counter that with knowledge. We can counter that with a passion for our system of government. Um, you know, however flawed it may be, it's still a, a wonderful system. And but the system only is successful uh, as the as the individuals who prop it up, right? And so we really have to engage young people uh, at an earlier age uh, and start teasing the fact that they're an incredibly important part of this country. Um, and registering to vote, voting running for office, volunteering in your community, helping other people um, is central to their success, their happiness, and to the overall well-being of, of their community. Um, and when they make those connections, when we help them make those connections, great things happen. Um, and, and hopefully um, the future of our democracy, um, uh, because it's in their hands, uh, we're, we're sort of facilitating um, a positive future. Um, and so I think we can shift an educational conversation to something that can be a unifier, but um, it can be tricky. I, I know it's a difficult um, you know, time, but again, when we make decisions that are centered around students and our educators, you can't go wrong. So usually my last question is, why would you consider, why would you, uh, try, how would you try to convince an independent or a Republican to vote for you? But since you are commissioner elect, I think I don't need to ask that question tonight. Um, I think I'm going to ask, what are your top three priorities once you do take office in January? Uh, first, um, we need to change the meeting times uh, from the afternoon to the evening so that folks can participate. I think that's important. Um, we need to have office hours and town hall forums um, so that folks can participate. Um, and I think we also need to, to, to think about um, how do we engage with social media, uh, the newspapers and every, every outlet uh, to inform folks along the way about what decisions are taking place, when they're taking place, and how their voices can be heard. So um, I'm, I'm looking at writing a monthly column, for instance, we're gonna have a video series that is posted that kind of talks about these topics in a, in a longer format. Um, we're, we're gonna be looking at a lot of things like that. So it, it may not necessarily be specific policy issues. Um, it's more about, we need to work on the structure. It, when the structure is solidified in a way that um, you know, engages the community, engages the public, um, then we can actually get to the bigger issues like climate change, public transit, and, and, and you name it. So my top priorities are immediately getting to work on making a more accessible and transparent county government. Sounds fantastic. And hopefully that'll encourage people to show up 